Hey Nerdy Knitters, Tanya here. It's time to settle in for another episode of the Nerdy Knitting Monthly Podcast. So get your knitting and your favorite beverage and let's settle in for a good chat. I hope that you had a wonderful Christmas with lots of knitting related things underneath the Christmas tree with your name on them. I'm recording this before Christmas, so I don't know what I'm getting for Christmas yet. Well, I've got a pretty good idea because I did select some of the yarn that I wanted and my husband's good about just buying what I tell him to buy for Christmas. So hopefully I got those things, but we won't be able to see them just yet. You'll have to wait till January's episode to see what I got for Christmas. But I hope yours was really good. And before we dive into the knitting, I just like to chat and catch up on things and talk about what I'm reading or watching. And I'm reading a new book this week. Well, an old book actually, but new to me. I don't know if you've ever heard of Daphne du Maurier. Her book, Rebecca, is very popular. It's been turned into more than one movie. I think I've seen at least two different versions of it. So and there's probably more than that. She's got other books as well. Um, Jamaica Inn is another one that's probably not as popular, but there is a show, a show based on that or a movie. I'm not quite sure. I know I saw it a while ago, but I can't remember who was in it. I want to say the one of the daughters from Downton Abbey was in that, I think. Could be thinking of something else, but I think it's that. Anyway, I'm reading another one of her books. I read Rebecca, I think when I was a teenager and really liked it, but never read anything else by Daphne du Maurier until I was an adult. Then I read, I read Rebecca again, watched, there's a recent movie version. I think it's on Netflix, which was pretty good. I think I can't remember the book, so I don't know like how it compares. If you're the type who likes the books, um, the movies to stay close to the books. I'm not quite sure. I, th I think it was probably fairly faithful. I, I enjoyed it. But anyway, I'm reading another of her books called My Cousin Rachel, and I think I'm actually enjoying it more than I did Rebecca. I know Rebecca is probably one of her most popular ones, but I'm really liking this book. I haven't finished it. I'm about two thirds of the way through, and it's a very good story, and you're never quite sure if... Um, the main character is being duped by this woman or if she's as innocent as she appears if you've never read it and you when you've read any of other any of her other books and you probably want to give this one a try as well um there is a movie version of it the the book i have actually has um the actress's face rachel weiss i think is in the movie um so i'm gonna have to look that up after i finish the book to see how the movie compares, I guess, but we have to see how the book ends first. Maybe I'll end up absolutely hating the ending. Who knows? But so far I am enjoying it. The book, the characters are very engaging and interesting. And, um, anyway, so that's all for reading. If you like to read, then tell me what you're reading this week. I'm, I have a stack of books because I'm hoping to do lots of reading over the upcoming break. I've got a couple weeks off, hopefully, so I can just sit around and be lazy and knit and by the time you're watching this, I'll be halfway through my first week off. Um, but anyway, let's move on to actually knitting related things. And I've got some news to share. The Knitting Guild Association has conferences. They have introduced um, an online conference that they hold every year. They also hold in-person events as well. But the online event is very popular because, of course, you don't have to actually travel. You don't have to have hotel expenses and all of those other expenses related to attending knitting related events it's all online and i'm teaching at the next one it's going to be in april at their next level knitting conference teaching a class on cables um very basic introduction to them well but i have everything outlined we're going to of course learn how to cable without a cable needle and with a cable needle both methods but then we'll talk about lots of other things like um the abbreviations, which are not standardized, but what you can look for in the cable abbreviations to decipher them, how they're charted, and the different rules that sort of govern cables and how they are worked and how you can create your own cables. And it's a lot packed into just 90 minutes. It's sort of, I've developed the class before for um, a three hour class. So it's sort of the first half of that three hour class that I'll be teaching at the conference. So I'm very excited about that. It's the first time I've taught online like that 
um, besides doing YouTube videos, which are lots of good practice, I think I'm not really, I mean, I'm a little nervous about it, but I've done live streams here in the past and of course recording videos, so I'm not super nervous. Who knows? I might get nervouser, nervouser as the event gets closer, but it's going to be in April. I'll have a link down below so you can check that out if you'd like to attend. There are tons of classes. I'm really looking forward to attending. There's a lot of classes that I want to attend and learn from because I don't know everything and I like, there's always something new to learn. I feel like the more you learn about something, the less you, the more you realize you don't know. And I still feel that way about knitting because there's just so much that you can learn. So many different techniques and different ways of doing things. Like I could do things one way, like I was researching some different methods for cabling without a cable needle. And I ran across some that I'd never even heard of before. I like the method I use, so I'm probably not going to try these other ones, but still there's more than one way to get there in the end. So I like to know those different methods so I can have choices. Do you know what I mean? So anyway, that is coming up. I've just finished creating like the student handout, which has like the swatch instructions because there's homework we're gonna swatch and actually practice making cables. And I'm working on the, like the video presentation part of it now. I'll be like talking to the camera, I'll have some overhead to demonstrate things, but I also have sort of like a video presentation as well. And some swatches that I have to prep for that too. So those are all done. So I'm pretty much ready to go. So that will be in April. That's the only, well, it's knitting related, but not just like a knitting project. So I thought I would share that with you and hopefully you can attend. It would be love. I would love to see people who hang out with me on the podcast, you know, and chat with me. I'd love to see them at that event too. So you'll find a link for that down below. So let's dive into your questions. Every week before I record, I ask if you have any questions that you want to chat about because I like to make this as useful as possible. And perhaps at some point it will just turn into a monthly chat about your questions kind of podcast. We'll see. But the first one's from Joanne. I'm a fairly new knitter and I get confused with the gauge of the needles and the various yarns to make a hat. I make them too large or too small. Is there a chart helping out a newbie? So my, there is a chart that you can reference for like gauge and needle size. Um, the Craft Yarn Council standards, standard yarn weight chart, that's what I refer to. Um, it has their little symbol that you can often find on yarn labels, but then underneath it, you'll also find like the different names that you would see on a yarn label. So if it doesn't have their symbol, you, you can at least look for those names. You can also look at the gauge information on the yarn and then look on the chart to see where that gauge falls on the Craft Yarn Council's chart. And then they'll also have the recommended needle sizes because it varies. You can have a few different needle sizes that are appropriate for a specific weight of yarn. So I would recommend their chart. I'll link to it down below. If you want to look at like the recommended general needle sizes, but it really comes down to the fabric you like. Now, as for knitting your hats too big or too small, um, if that's an issue, I mean, if you if it doesn't really bother you and you can just give those hats away, that's one thing. But if you really want a hat to fit, then you are gonna have to swatch um, to figure out how that yarn reacts to those needles, how they work together. If you don't like to swatch, honestly, I don't really swatch for a hat. I'm knitting a hat now without swatching for a first. I have a video about how I do that. I'll link it down below as well. Well, anything I talk about that I know I have a link for, you can always find it down below in the video description box. But let me see, did I have anything else here? Oh yes, after a while, because you do say you're new, a new knitter, after a while you will start to recognize like the needle size that you like for a specific type of yarn or how many stitches you generally have to cast on for a specific size. That's something you sort of learn as you keep knitting hats. We've all knit things that are too small or too big in that process, but you can, I mean, if you don't mind knitting and then ripping out because I mean, I'm <laughs> at the point where I can definitely try this on, fits fine, perfect. Um, but you can, you can rip your projects back out, even if they're all done and you don't like the, the, the 
um, fit of the hat, you can still rip it out and do it again. You don't have to keep that finished hat unless it's a super fuzzy yarn and it's really hard to pull it back out. But in general, you can reuse the yarn and knit the hat again by casting on more stitches or fewer stitches. But if you finished it, wash it and let it dry. Follow the yarn label instructions for the proper care and then take some measurements to get an idea of your stitch and row gauge. So, and write it down if you want to, like just keep, make, make a notebook, keep track of those things. And then you can like make a note that it was too tight. This was the number of stitches that I used. So then you'll know later on, okay, I shouldn't cast on more stitches, even measure the hat, like take note of these things, use it as a learning experience. We've all done that. Believe me, I have knit plenty of socks that are too tight. My first, I think at least two pairs were too small. Um, and then I had a pair that was too big. Like <laughs> you're just going to have, you're going to have that experience if you're not swatching first. And honestly, I don't swatch for things that are small enough to be the swatch themselves. But I'm okay with ripping things out or just giving things away if they don't fit. If you're not okay with that, then you really should swatch. But hopefully that is helpful. Oh, also, Knit Picks does have a hat size guide. I'm going to link to that too. It breaks it down like in a chart, like according to age and like the size you should aim for for the hat. Hopefully that's helpful. If anybody else has any advice for Joanne or for any of the other questions that we chat about, please leave your comments down below. And if you're the one who asked the question, go down and check out those comments. Sometimes I share them in the next episode, but we're, we're only doing monthly podcasts. So it feels like a long time to keep referring back to the same question when it's just once a month. So I do encourage you to go see what other people have to say. I'm sure they have really good advice to share. And next is Evelyn's question. I knit for stress relief, but my tension is off. How can I fix my tension? I'm an English knitter. Okay, I think I'm guessing you're probably from like the UK or someplace because um, they usually refer to gauge as tension there. So I'm thinking you're talking about gauge, which is, which is what we call it here in North America. I just want to confirm that because tension can also refer to the the way you knit, like if your stitches are nice and even or if they're wonky, but I think in this case, you're probably referring to your gauge. If not, correct me and we can refer, we can talk about that, but I'm going to assume that we're talking about gauge tension, not like your actual knitting, how the knitted fabric looks. So first off, now if you're knitting for stress relief and you're not concerned about the fit, then I wouldn't be too concerned, especially if you're knitting things like shawls or scarves or wraps. I mean, be besides like the yardage needed for the project, you can get away with not having the right gauge. <clears throat> but if it's something that needs to fit, sorry, I had a froggy throat there for a second. So back to what we were talking about. If you want the thing to fit, then yes, you do have to match the gauge or the tension of the designer for that pattern. But I struggle with this one because if, if that's going to cause you more stress, then it sort of defeats the purpose. But this is where your swatch can come in handy. And I'm going to link to a video from Suzanne Bryan about how she swatches. And this method that she uses is actually what we used in the master knitting program. Right in level one, one of the first things you're doing when you're doing all of the swatches is knit like what they called, I think it's a, the preliminary swatch and it has instructions for that in there. And hers is very similar. Um, but you knit like it's, I think six inches wide. I'm not quite sure, but you use three different needle sizes with like a row break in between. So you can see where you use the different sizes instead of swatching with one size, washing and blocking, finding out that, oh, it's not the right size. You do three different needle sizes all at once to find out which one is the right one or which one you prefer if you're all right with not having the same gauge, which you can do that as well but that's a big topic for another day. But um, instead of swatching just with one size, I do recommend you swatch. Use the recommended size for the pattern and depending on your knitting, if you know you knit more tightly, then start with a recommended size and then go up a size and then go up another size. If you knit on the loose side, then you do the opposite. You start with a recommended size 
and then you go down a needle size and you go down a needle size. And that will at least get you in the ballpark. Hopefully you shouldn't have to make more than like a few needle size adjustments to get where you need to be. And when it comes to the stitch and row gauge, in general, the stitch gauge is more important unless you're knitting something like a, a Fair Isle stranded color yoke sweater where that row gauge for the yoke of the sweater, that is important. But in most cases, if it's just something where you have to knit to a certain length, you can use your own row gauge to determine that length. You don't have to use the pattern's row gauge. And it's the stitch gauge that's more important. So you can focus on the stitch gauge and then just find out your row gauge after you have pretty much gotten on target for the stitch gauge of the, the, the project that you're working on. Oh, and two other notes that I wrote down here. I've got my computer over here so I can refer to the things that I noted down is you can also try changing the needle materials if the sizes aren't making much of a difference. Then try switching to a different needle material. Like I, you know, prefer to knit on metal needles, but sometimes I might want to try like a bamboo needle or a wood or something like that. And that does change your gauge, your tension. And what's the other thing? Oh, make sure that you are taking your measurements after you have washed and blocked your swatch following like the care instructions on the yarn label because taking your measurements before doesn't matter if you're ever going to wash that thing then it's going to change how that yarn reacts sometimes in a huge way depending on the yarn and how it's been spun so you want to take those measurements after you've washed that swatch and you've let it dry it should be completely dry you also want to make sure your swatch is large enough don't knit just a little four inch swatch Knit a good size six inch swatch and then you can you can either measure four inches but there's nothing magical about four inches that just seems to be the standard everybody settled on you can take a wider measurement i usually knit like a six inch swatch minimum and then i measure the whole width of it minus like the very edge stitches which don't look the same as the rest of the fabric but i always make a note of how many stitches i cast on so I can measure it when I'm done and knowing I'm going to like subtract two from that number, one for each edge, and then take my measurements from that. So I get a larger area to measure and I'm not trying to measure and don't be measuring just one inch. You're not going to get an accurate gauge measurement from just an inch. So I hope those tips are helpful. If anybody else has any advice about not matching the tension or the gauge in a pattern, then I'd love to hear what you do to work on that. And then another question. Thank you for the podcasts. I enjoy them very much. When trying to substitute yarns when knitting a project, what is more important, the yardage per gram or the gauge specified for the yarn? There are so many different yarns. Okay, gauge is going to be your number one priority. And this is where I would refer you back to that Craft Yarn Council chart from the first question. You want to choose a yarn that fits within the same category. So it either has the same symbol on the yarn label as the Craft Yarn Council symbol. It has the same basic gauge range or that recommends the same needle size somewhere in there. You want the same gauge. After that, you do want to think about that yardage to weight. Is that what it was? Yardage per gram. You do want to think about that but in the terms of the fiber, because you don't want to be picking a pattern that uses wool and then you decide to substitute cotton because yeah, the weight for those two fibers is very, very different. Cotton's a lot heavier than wool. So that garment is not going to come out the same as what you see pictured in the pattern. So after you've chosen or after you know what the yarn weight is or the gauge category that it falls within with that craft yarn council chart you want to look at the fiber you want to choose something that's very similar it doesn't have to be exactly the same but you know if it's a merino wool choose another wool it doesn't have to be a merino but i would still stick within the same fiber family if it was knit with a cotton then look for a similar cotton and there are different types of cotton i mean there's the cotton that you use to knit a dishcloth 
you would not want to knit a sweater with that. It's going to be way too heavy, but there are other softer cottons like Pima cottons that are great for knitting garments. So you want to look at the fiber and find something that is similar. And then you can compare that yardage to grams to see it, it should be fairly close because you're going to see a difference even in the same fiber content like that, that cotton. If you have like that dishcloth cotton, it's going to be heavier than a Pima cotton, even in that regard. Same with your wools, the way they're spun can affect how heavy that final skein is. If you have like, what, what is it, a woolen spun, it's very light and airy. You're going to get more yardage for that skein than if you have a worsted spun, tightly twisted, something that's great for cables, it's going to weigh more than that woolen spun yarn. So you do wanna look at those yarn properties as well to see which type of yarn you should use. I know this, it can be tricky to find the right kind of yarn, but the more experience you get with different fibers, you'll start to see these different properties. Like they're even in wools, like one wool is not gonna be the same as another, but that's your starting places. Choose the same fiber family. But after your gauge, of course, you don't wanna choose a worsted weight yarn for a fingering weight project. You wanna stick within the same gauge, then look at the fiber content, and then even go a little further and look at that uh, yardage to grams to see, and that will give you an idea of how, um, what type of yarn that is. Because when you have two wools, if it's got a lot of yardage compared to other wools, you can imagine that's probably a lighter yarn. It's going to be not so heavy. And other wools that have been more tightly twisted and more they're more compact, you're going to have fewer yards in that skein of yarn because that yarn is heavier. So it does still matter. The gauge information is still more important, but let me see, I thought I had something else here. Oh yes, a recommendation for learning to substitute would be yarnsub.com. You can type in uh, any pretty much commercially available yarn and then you it like spits out a list of other yarns that are similar. But then it also, what's really helpful is it breaks it down into these different categories that are important, like the gauge, like the fiber content, even like the plies and the twist and all of that. So you can learn to identify these different things and then also get ideas for substituting different yarns as well. So I hope that was helpful. If you have more tips to share, then please leave them down in the comments. I'm sure you have some things to add too, so I would love to hear what they are. And one more question, Lori, she asks, um, what about doing a year in review or 2023 goals? I usually do that, but this year I decided that I'm going to knit more of what I feel rather than having a list of to-dos. I'm not really a year in review kind of person. Yeah, <laughs> I'm too busy. I'm too busy planning the next thing that's coming. And I do usually set some goals. I have a few things in mind that we'll talk about, but I have to say that I like your goal of not having all of the to-dos and just knitting what you want. I've been feeling that lately because I've had so many things, so many things on my needles, but nothing is for me. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's either socks that I'm doing tutorials for, or it's designs that I'm releasing myself, or it's designs that are going to be in publications. So, I mean, I can't complain because I get paid to knit, you know, I can, I'm doing something I do love to do. I'm, I'm doing something that is creative and I love that. But sometimes you just want to, you know, pick a fun pattern and some pretty yarn and just knit for fun. So I am doing that over the Christmas break. I'll have been doing that for the last few days, hopefully by the time you see this video, but that is my plan. I've got a few more gift things to get finished, but all of my design commissions are out the door. I just finished the sock tutorial for January, so I'm good for a bit on that, so I have some time for more selfish knitting. And hopefully I'm getting some yarn for, I had, let me think, I wrote down yarn for two sweaters and two shawls, and even some dye, so I can dye some of the yarn for one of the sweaters. So I am looking forward to trying some of that. But yes, I definitely identify with that, but, and it's my own fault for trying to schedule so many things at once, but we're halfway through the sock tutorials and that'll probably take a bit of a break from tutorials. But saying that I already have some ideas for next year after we're done with socks, after I've had a bit of a break, 
I thought maybe we'd tackle sweaters. That's a big one though. So it might just be one or two a year. And I think I can't quite decide how to go about that. I want to do, well, the pattern with like all of the multiple sizes like I have for the sock tutorials, but more of a step-by-step -step video series. And I don't think that would be useful on YouTube because I don't want to do like one giant video for a sweater, but I don't really want to split it up into like a series either. So I'm thinking of doing that sort of off the platform. I do have like a, something I use for, I have a, the, a course called Fix Your Knitting Mistakes and that's all hosted somewhere else, not on YouTube. And I'm thinking that might be a great place to sort of house a sweater knitting workshop. So I thought we would, I don't know, I would do a poll to see what type of sweater. If we wanna do just a plain beginner, I don't know, drop shoulder sweater and work through the process, sort of do it like a knit along, but not on YouTube. So it would be a paid for pattern because it would be, I mean, walk you step by step through it. Or instead of like a super beginner pattern, maybe something that's, you know, you've knit a sweater or two and you wanna do like a customized sweater where we could take like that drop shoulder sweater, but then we can talk about modifying sleeve length or the length of the sweater or even have sections for different necklines. So you can choose the neckline that you want, like whether you want a crew neck or a V neck. Um, so I'm, I don't know, the idea is percolating in my mind. I'd love to know if any of that would be interesting to you. I mean, I don't want to make a whole big sweater class if nobody wants to do it, you know? I mean, I don't want to be knitting sweaters from all by my, well, I want to knit sweaters for myself, but I mean, I don't want to produce a whole video series about sweaters if nobody wants to like knit a sweater with me. So I'd love to know about that. And the other thing that is on my mind sort of for upcoming things is, um, well, different video ideas, of course, for the channel. Um, but I would like to, instead of making specific tutorials, like, okay, let's do socks on this way and let's do socks this way. I would like to somehow do tutorials based on like the things I'd like to knit. Like I've got, uh, if I get the yarn, there's a, an Andrea Mowry shawl. I think it's called Bobbles. Um, it's got like, it's just garter stitch, brioche, asymmetric, asymmetrical triangle shawl, nothing major, but maybe some sort of a, a video that talks about brioche, but in the context of that particular shawl, because that's what I'm knitting. So I'm thinking about that, but then I'm also thinking ahead because, I mean, I've finished the master in hand knitting course and I'm working on the Knitting Guild Association's like professional design course. I'm on module two for that. I haven't done any of it for the last few months, but hopefully in the new year, I only have two things left to do for that module and then I can get it sent off. And I have one module left. So I'm sort of thinking like after that, sort of my, I guess what you would call professional development. I like to keep learning. Part of knitting for me is the exploration of new, new topics, new techniques, even, I don't know, the historical side of knitting. All of that is interesting to me as well as like, you know, I want to knit the things because I want the things. I want a new sweater or I want to do this or I want to knit a gift or, or I like designing because I get to, I get to play with new yarns that I might not ever buy myself um, or design things that I might not wear, but I would love to like, you know, design that thing or so there's different reasons, lots of reasons to knit. But I'm thinking ahead for like sort of that professional development thing. And I don't know if anybody else here watches Roxanne Richardson's channel, but she has like a monthly or a weekly podcast as well. And she has been, she's just finished her like historical sweaters. Like she's done a sweater for each decade from like the nineties all the way back to like 1890, maybe I'm not quite sure where she ended up, but like, and looking at like the historical aspect of sweater knitting. And I've been really fascinated by that. But I'm, and I'm thinking I might want to do something similar to that. That's going to be like a long-term, she called it her long-term project. And it really is because it's not like you can sit down and just knit 20 sweaters in a year. It's going to take a while. I figure if I do two or three a year, that would be a plenty. Um, but I'm thinking more of, I like the idea of that, but I would like to look more at like the, 
the sweater design, like the patterns, how they've changed through history, but also geographically, like different sweaters from different places, like on the west coast of Canada, the, there's the the Salish sweaters. Uh, the that is very interesting to me to look at, like the history of that garment, and then also knit a garment using yarn that they would have used or something similar. I mean, a lot of these when you get into older patterns, you're not going to find the exact yarn, but something similar to that, or like. Um, Fair Isle sweaters, like what's the historical significance of that? How did they end up with all of those motifs and using all of those different colors and, or the, um, Norwegian or Scandinavian, like their ski sweaters with those, you know, really high contrast colors. And just, I'm interested in seeing like the historical pattern for those different geographical sort of locations, but also, um, yeah, how they, how those came about, like the stitch patterns they use, the yarns they use, and or Icelandic sweaters. That that yarn's very different than something you'd see in a Norwegian sweater. You know, with that high contrast color. Icelandic sweaters are like those really soft, not soft, scratchy yarns, but they're very lightly spun, so they're very wooly and warm. And there's just so much to explore in these different geographical locations. But I feel like that would be a lot of sweaters because there's just so many. And then I also don't know much about. I mean, I know quite a bit about like European and North American knitting but I don't know much about knitting in like South America or Asian countries a bit about Russian knitting like I found different knitting patterns or stitch patterns online very pretty pretty patterns um or even knitting in Africa I mean knitting probably started in Egypt but I mean I don't know, like these other places, I don't know anything about if there's any knitting history in those places. So I'm wondering if I should like just geographically like pick Europe and focus on the European sweaters first and then maybe see from there. Because even that would take a while because there's so many different sweater, like sweater influences just in Europe. So I don't know. <laughs> that one is still percolating. I've got time because I'm still working on my design course. And I still have to finish that. And I'm probably not going to be finished that before next summer. Hopefully by summer I will be done. But um, that is, yeah, so that was a good question, Lori. Like it really made me think about where we're heading. So I haven't really set any goals, but I am thinking about some things that I would like to do in the future. But then there's also trying to fit it in with everything else because I am doing tutorials on here and I'm designing and releasing my own patterns and then I'm also working for publications and it takes a lot of time. But before we get to what's on my knitting needles, I just want to mention this video's sponsor, which is Scrumptious Pearl, who produces this lovely self-striping yarn. This is the second pair of socks that I've knit with her yarn and it's absolutely fabulous. She kindly sent me two skeins of yarn that I could use for some tutorials and I just want to promote her because her yarn is wonderful. The self-striping colors are really great and she has other yarns as well. She does have, I think it's fingering weight, it's, um, solid, semi-solid colors. Then she also has striping yarn in worsted weight yarn. So if you're looking for self-striping in a heavier weight of yarn, then you can check that out. I'll have a link for her down below. This color is called Cornflowers and she has this base. It's called Stripe Me Up. It's super wash merino and nylon and it's really great for socks and she's also located in Canada which is important since I'm in Canada I'd like to find Canadian yarn dyers that I can use for tutorials and for projects and things like that because it's just nice to support people who are also running a small business in the same country as me and that leads me right into what's off my needles which is that pair of socks this tutorial came out this month so I just wanted to mention it now I don't know if these were finished last month as well I can't remember or if I finish them after recording that podcast but this pattern is um, a knit two purl two rib along the leg of the sock and it's continued on it's got a gusset and heel turn I think this one is the Dutch heel or square heel um, using the magic loop method for this tutorial so I'll link down below if you want to check that out but really nice pair of socks, very comfy. I love a rib sock because, I mean, they just fit so well. Usually when I do like a heel flap and gusset, which I prefer, 
I don't really care for stranded or not stranded the slip stitch patterns along the back uh, stockinette is fine but it tends to be a bit loose but I really like to put the rib pattern on the heel flap because that really hugs my the back of my foot really well so you'll find everything you need to know about knitting magic loop socks in that tutorial and in last month's episode I know I did mention these patterns and they are finally done <laughs> I drafted these patterns myself um, the hat has been knit three times I started as a beret had it all finished with like that um, the, the way you would shape a beret on the top with like sort of the wheel the spokes and wheel on top and did not like it put it on my head and I just oh I didn't like it so I decided to go with more of just a gathered top and I much prefer it I feel like it's more like a cupcake or something but it does use like that beret shaping down here you cast on fewer like your certain number of stitches for the the cuff of the hat and then you increase quite a lot to do this stranded part right here and then you decrease them very quickly to get like this gathered top and then I just I had enough yarn left over to do a pom-pom as well and two I mean Latvian braids the two different directions a bit of stranded knitting and then that's also repeated on the mittens as well we've got Latvian braids and a bit of stranded knitting here and um, so this pattern is out right now I think I released it last week when you're watching this I'm trying to keep track of that and if you're on the mailing this list, list then you got a notice about getting this for free which if you're not on the mailing list and you want the this pattern for free um, I'll try to remember to put a link down below for that as well you join the mailing list um, and in the like the next email you receive the next weekly email I'll send I'll have the code in there so you can get this pattern for free but this is only limited to sort of my Christmas gift to my subscribers and I only do discounts for they're the only ones who get discounts as well I don't release discounts for patterns to like the general public just the people on my email list because I figure they're the ones who really might want to knit the things if they're actually on you know want to get emails from me so anyway um, this is my Christmas gift to my subscribers so and it's still you have I think until January to get that for free if you want to join my email list but this oh it uses uh, Julie Asseline yarn she is a yarn dye company here in Canada she's in Quebec based in the same province as me this uses her journey worsted which I love it's probably one of my favorite favorite yarns I just when I want like I like it for twisted stitches and cables because it's very it's got a good nice high twist the it's a blend of two different sheep breeds Rambouillet and Targi so it's not scratchy but it, I mean it's not super soft either but it feels like it's, it's just sort of like a good hard wearing high twist yarn like I really like it and I used it for let me see a poncho I think about a year ago and I had a lot of difficulties designing that and I ripped out the yarn I can't tell you maybe four times um, and even after the fourth time it was still like it's one of those yarns that just holds up really well it was still really great like there were it was sometimes you know like if you keep ripping something out and trying to re-knit it starts to get fuzzy and feel a little worn this yarn doesn't do at least after about four ripping rippings out it was still really good and I like it she's got great color choices and I like I mean it's not really a yarn you use for like standard stranded color work in general because you really want your yarns to like sort of blend together but I when I want color work that's really going to stand out and be really noticeable I do like her yarn I used it also for the sweater that's back there and this is actually the leftovers that I had from the sweater I turned into a hat and mitt set so it's one pattern it includes I think two sizes for two hats or and two sizes for the mittens as well all in one pattern because it's basically a two skein project if you have two skeins of yarn you might need more for the pom-pom depending on your gauge um, but two skeins of yarn you can knit a hat and mittens so that is my Christmas gift to you I've also knit slippers I don't want to hold them up too much because I've been wearing them and they're very dirty my floors are not very clean I guess they all that dog hair I have a beagle and she's shedding right now um, 
but I had some yarn from a Knit Picks, a design that'll be coming out in the spring. I had some leftovers, so I'm like, I need a pair of slippers in the winter. You know, my floors are cold and I just wanted something I could slip on real easy. There's not really, I use like three different patterns that I found for free and then just sort of like looked at how they did things and then I figured it out. So it's, there's not a pattern for these, but they have like a little, you work like this square, the heel flap first all by itself. And then you pick up stitches all around it to do like the sock and then you just do like a normal top sock toe shaping. So I did alternate colors for these. Uh, I thought that would be really fun. And I have plenty of yarn so I could do another pair and then I could have matching ones if I wanted to. Um, but yeah, very just little simple house slippers. It's Knit Picks Bravo Worsted. So 100% acrylic yarn. Um, hopefully it's holding up pretty well. I've been wearing them quite a lot and they're really filthy though. <laughs> So we won't show those anymore. And I did finish um, another design. It's coming out in Cast On Magazine, which is the publication for the Knitting Yield Association. Uh, it's coming out their winter issue in February. And I wrote an article for them too. So I'm very excited. It's the first like knitting article besides like my on my own website, you know, the things I write on there um, about grafting in garter stitch. That will be coming out. And then this, well, this is just like my, my swatch shawl because I already mailed it out. It's already there, which I'm always worried about mailing designs. Cause you know, I mean, you, you just worry, you know, <laughs> like you want to make sure it gets there on time. It's not due until January, but I wanted to make sure it was out the door before Christmas. So this is, I, so I don't have it to show you. I have, but I do have like the little swatch size. Cause this, what, this was my swatch. <laughs> um, so this is a square shawl. I think it's about 52 inches square, the finished one. Let me tell you, that was a lot of knitting. The It starts in the center and you work your way out. It's basically, if you've ever done a triangle shawl, it's four triangle shawls. <laughs> well, it's four triangles, but when you do a triangle shawl, you have actually two triangles that gives you the larger shape. When you do that top down triangle, it's got two. This is sort of doubled, so it's a square instead of a triangle. So. I don't know if you can really see because I'm wearing blue behind it so you can't see it but it's knit from the center out it has this sort of floral pattern and then like a border pattern here which is a zigzag and then this part the edging is worked sideways you bind off your stitches as you work the edging and you go around the corners Ooh, that's my grafting right there and then you graft the two ends of that edging together so this was a really big project but it came out so nice. Um, a lot of the time when I get samples back or when I have lots of things to knit, they end up in a few bins that I keep. And then like when I go visit family or whatever, I'm planning to just like take it with me and let people have things because I can't, <laughs> it's a lot of extra things. Like the things I design, especially like sometimes I'm not designing it for me. I'm just designing it, you know, because there's something I want to try or whatever. So I've got bins of stuff to give away. So I give it to family and friends. And But this, all that to say, this is one of those items that's not going to go in the bin. I'm keeping this for myself because the full-size shawl, oh, it's, it's lovely. And not just the knitting. And actually I do. I think it's one of the best things I've ever knit, honestly. It's gorgeous. Like, I love it. I mean, I mean, you can only see the little swatch here, but you can get an idea of how, like, a full-size shawl. And it's just... And you wear it and it oh it's so soft the yarn i love this yarn this is Jelina yarns this is also a yarn dyer here in canada um and this is her bella yarn now this is a blend of 75 percent merino and then there's some cashmere and there's some silk so nice yarn like it's just it's soft it's very warm like i wrapped it around me when it was all done and blocked and i'm like i just want to see fold it over sort of like a triangle and wrap it around and oh like warm right away it feels very warm because you've got the wool but then it's got that cashmere so it's soft and it's got that silk so it's got like this just beautiful drape this one is actually blocked not as it's blocked more loosely than the finished shawl the, the finished shawl I really stretched it open so it's got like this really beautiful drape from the silk and from the blocking so I'm very happy with this, I, but I forgot even to take a picture. I had to like spread it out on my bed to dry, 
because with a beagle in the house, there's nowhere else that's safe. I put the gate up so she can't come in and it was safe right there. But yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a lot of knitting though. Um, the middle part actually didn't feel like too much, but then when you get to the edging, it's a lot because it's a, this edging here, it's one repeat is about 16 rows. And for those 16 rows, you end up binding off eight stitches, just eight stitches. So I think it takes about 72 repeats of that edging chart to get around the whole shawl. So the edging, and I, I think it took me two weeks and that was like a good steady knitting almost every day during the week. I try to like do other things on the weekend to give myself a break from thing like commissioned stuff or design stuff. But two, I think pretty much two solid weeks to finish the edging. But the end result I feel is worth it. Like it's one of my favorite knits, honestly. And I'm not sure I want to design another one. Maybe give me a while to think about that. The actual design process was very easy. I just picked out some stitch patterns I like and combined like combining them, you know, like it's basically there's a little flower here. It's the same flower that's actually in the body of the shawl. So, I mean, picking that was the knitting was fine too, but I this is one of those cases where yeah, the finished object is what you're knitting for because it's just it's really lovely and the yarn is just beautiful. And I have enough left over that I think I can do like a smaller I'm not sure. I'm thinking um, like maybe a crescent shaped shawl, but where you cast on the length of it with like some very, really pretty delicate stitch pattern and then work up to the neckline and then do some short row shaping to make it a crescent. That's what I'm thinking about. I've got enough yarn, I think, left over to do something like that because the yardage is very generous. Oh, I don't, can't see it on oh, 497 yards, 115 grams. So it's a generous size skein. So you could do, definitely do like a shawlette size project with just one skein. I've got one full skein and then <clears throat> part of another skein. So I think I've got enough for some kind of a shawlette thing. But anyway, very, very, very beautiful yarn. And if you like, you're looking for a good splurge yarn for a really nice shawl that you want to work on, then Jelina Yarns, this one, um, her Bella. Bella is the yarn line. The colorway I think is new, um, Starless Sky, I think, or Starless Night is this color. It's just this beautiful dark navy blue. It's got that bit of a shine from the silk. Anyway, I think I could go on and on about this yarn. I'm, let's look at other things that I've finished. Now the last thing off my needles is another pair of socks. These are the socks for, they're still a bit damp actually. These are the socks for January's tutorial. We're gonna do two socks at once on Magic Loop. This one uses Alley Cat yarns. I don't have the tag. I, this is her Leo BFL though. It's a blue face Lester yarn, which is my favorite yarn for socks because it's just a bit tougher than Merino. Merino's lovely and soft, but if you tend to wear out your socks, like sometimes I, mine do, if I don't knit them tightly enough, or there's lots of reasons they wear out. Anyway, then, but BFL is a great choice for a more sturdy sock yarn. It is slightly scratchier, but you're not gonna notice that on your feet. So the tutorial is for knitting both socks at the same time. And I did them in two different colors. Just, I thought it would be easier to do the demonstration. You know, I could, they, you obviously see the one sock and then you see a different sock on the same needles. But of course you don't have to do something like that. And then the contrast heels, cuffs and toes, a little bit of a stripe. And I had these blocking out yesterday and my daughter's like, ooh, I like those. She loves the, the contrasting colors. So after I do like the photo shoot and all of that, the pattern's all written, ready to go. Just have to finish up the editing the tutorial. Then these are probably gonna go in her Christmas stocking. So she'll have had them by the time you see this video, I guess. But so that tutorial will be coming out in January and really lovely yarn. I really like this yarn for knitting socks. It's very sturdy. I think these will last her a long time. Now that's what's off my needles and I've got sort of a project that's in between. The first one is off my needles, but I have to cast on the next one. I'm knitting a, a knit two purl two rib, but on the bias using this very drapey silk and linen yarn. This, new, this is a pattern that will be coming out in April, I think. Um, so this is the scarf 
that is quite long. Woo, came out really nice. So it starts at one point and then you're increasing and then until you get to the width you want. And this is just a scarf, so it's going to be just a thin one. But I mean, the rib pulls it in and you can leave it that way or you can, when I'm washing it, I can stretch it out so you can really see like that because they go off on the bias, which I really like. And I like the I like the rib going off in the bias like that. I just think so, think it looks really neat. So I do have a second color. I think this one's called platinum. It's like sort of a silvery color. It's really nice and kind of shiny from that silk. Um, so I'm going to be knitting like a wrap size. Same pattern. Pattern is all sort of the stitch pattern. It's like split into different sections. That part's all done. So I just need to sit and knit. And this is kind of mindless knitting because it's just knit two purl two rib. You gotta pay attention to your edges because you've got some I-cord going on and the shaping. So there is a little bit to pay attention to, but I'm looking forward to knitting this because it's just sort of like, can sit and watch TV and just work away at this. And my hands are busy without having to engage my mind too much. And sometimes that's what you want in a knitting project. And this one is also from Alley Cat Yarns, the socks I just showed. This is also her yarn. This is her silk and linen blend, 65% silk, 35% linen. And this one is in the goldenrod colorway, this pretty yellow, long, long scarf. That was two skeins of yarn. And I have four skeins of this lovely platinum. So that will, is gonna make, I don't think it's gonna be quite as long. I think I want it to be more wide. I want the depth, I want more depth. This, cause this is really, came out really long. <laughs> we'll see when I block it, if I decide to stretch it. I might leave this one where it has that, cause you have a choice when you have rib and the bias, like you can leave it more relaxed and you can still see the lines or you can stretch it out so you really see it. And even the, the tips here, like you can leave it more relaxed and have that sort of elongated shape or you can block it so you get a rectangle. So I have to decide, maybe I'll two, do two different methods for blocking and you can see the difference in them when I finish the wrap. But so this is sort of like, it's off my needles, but I'm gonna cast on the next one and get started on that. Either over Christmas break or I might hold off until January and just do selfish knitting this week. And I've been working on this for the length of the video. And this is just a simple knit one pearl one rib hat. My husband was looking through our bin of um, thing, knitted thing, you know, winter garments that we, I keep a basket by the door with like mittens and scarves and hats and all of those things. And he's going through and he's like, I don't think I have a hat in here. And I'm like, I've knit lots of hats, but none specifically for him. So I'm like, well, I've got this skein of yarn and it's just sort of been sitting there because I, I didn't buy it myself. It was uh, Knit Pick sent it to me to promote their new yarn line. So I didn't have plans for it because I am not a, I'm not a buy yarn and stash it away. I buy it when I have a specific project in mind. I do occasionally like dishcloth yarn I'll buy just to have on hand. Skeins of sock yarn as well because I know I'll knit socks with them. But in general, I don't buy it. I don't really have a big stash. I've got leftovers, lots of leftovers. Um, so anyway, I have this skein of yarn. So very simple hat pattern. Um, I have a video about this. Did I mention that earlier? It's like knitting a hat without a swatch. But the, the point is to use knit one pearl one rib because it's so stretchy so you can get away without swatching. But the yarn is really nice. This is Knit Picks. They're upcycle upcycle alpaca blend in the worsted weight and they sent like a little paper with it to explain it and I thought it was so neat that they it's like sort of all of the leftover bits from the spinning process you end up with lots of fiber and fluff like on the floor basically like so they collect all of that and they spin it again and they use that those leftover bits and this is a blend of alpaca wool and acrylic so it's really soft on the hand, really easy to knit with. This color is called Biscotti. This is their worsted weight yarn. I also have, let me see, another one here. Yes, this is the sport weight in Sapphire, which Sapphire is probably one of my favorite colors from them. This isn't Sapphire, is it? I don't think so. <laughs> but I've got I've got gloves myself, fingerless, fingerless gloves in this, not this particular yarn, but in this color. I just, I like blue, can you tell? Um, I'm thinking with this one, I might do like um, a beginner tutorial on knitting fingerless mitts and I'm trying to decide if it would be 
easy, like a super beginner project would be to knit them flat, like in a knit one purl one or knit two purl two, and then seam them up and leave a spot for your thumb. Then you can also practice like mattress stitch or like a beginner project for knitting in the round with like a thumb gusset and everything. I haven't quite decided which one to do with. I think that would be like a, be a super beginner, like tutorial for somebody who's knit like one or two things but still wants to practice then I'm thinking like knitting a pair of fingerless mitts flat and then sewing them up would be very simple so anyway if you have any ideas for me I was thinking like a beginner related project would be nice for that so this is the worsted weight yarn and I still have a lot to do I'm just going to keep going until I pretty much run out of yarn because I like well, I think we all, my husband, both of us like to like put it, pull a hat on and then fold it up because Canada, cold weather, <laughs> you want a extra protection around your ears. So you fold it over to double up the layer along the ears. So I'm just going to keep knitting until I run out of yarn because I don't want leftovers. I have so many leftovers, but I have a couple, I have one project right now for my leftovers. I haven't touched it in a while. The safe at home blanket is sort of my scrap project. It's a great pattern, very, it's not difficult. There's lots of little techniques, but none of them are very hard. Once you knit like the first one, you really see it and you're like, oh, this is simple. And you just keep going from there. So all of my like leftover worsted weight or so, DK I toss in there too. Um, sport weight, I probably would toss in, then I could just hold it double. That would work fine for a scrap blanket. So all of my like animal fiber, wools and all of those, they get tossed into a bag and when I have time, I can work on that. So I'm thinking of something similar for like my sock yarn. I've got lots of little bits of leftover fingering weight sock yarn. So I think I need to find a project for those too. And I'm thinking a blanket would be nice. So that's it for what's actually on my needles right now. I do have a few upcoming projects. I've got the next sock tutorial, which will be knitting socks on shorty needles. And also my husband requested another pair of slippers. He has a pair and he wants the same exact ones, but the other ones are starting to wear out the, on the bottom. I have like darned them, but they, he doesn't like the way, cause I used, well, this super bulky, this is the Lion brand Woolies thick and quick. And when you, I darned with the same yarn so now it forms like this thick pad and he says it's not that comfortable there so I'll have to remember that next when I knit these next time when I have to darn them because I will he slides his feet on the floor at home when he wears slippers so I know they're gonna wear out I just will not use the same yarn or it's sort of is it spun it might be two plies I could like unravel and just use one ply and that would work but the, the slippers he likes are the non-felted slippers by Yuko Nakamura. They're on their free pattern on Ravel, uh, Ravelry. Um, and I've knit them for him before. He really likes the shape and the fit. So I'm going to knit another pair of those probably over Christmas break. If I finish them in time, they can go in his stocking. But we'll see about that. Um, but just Lion Brand Woolies thick and quick. Nothing super expensive, like just really quick and easy. And it's super bulky yarn. They knit up really fast. So that's it for my projects. And I have something else to show, not knitting related, but I cleaned out this bin and now it's just for spinning because I got a drop spindle over the summer and my goal was just to give it a try. After I finished my master knitting program and I passed, this was sort of my reward to myself. I got like 100 grams of fiber, it comes like this, um, and a drop spindle. And I'm, I spun some yarn. They're still in their singles, which means they've only been, like it comes like this <laughs> and you sort of peel it off and you spin it out. And this was my first one. You can't really see on the camera, but I can see how thick and thin and oh my word, it's a mess. This one looks better. This must've been my last one. This one's not too bad. But um, so these are all like singles, one ply. So my next step is to like ply two of them together. I might wait until I do some of these colors. My husband surprised me for St. Nicholas Day. We like to buy little gifts for December 6th, you know, and he picked up some more for me in these really fun colors. Some wool bat. Yes, wool bats. I'm still learning the terminology, but I have actually spun and I did it so much over one weekend that my shoulders were sore from like holding it and spinning it. And it's a lot of fun. Like, 
yeah, I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's fun. If you, I mean, it's not, I think it's like $15 for one of these. So I think with a hundred grams of that, like with the, the wool, and I think it came to less than 30 for together. So it's something to try out for not much money. And I've got some yarn that I have no idea. This one is really a mess. I don't think I'm going to be making anything with that. I'll just keep it the way it is so I can show the first yarn I spun. But the other two aren't so bad. So I might ply them together and I might actually knit something with them. But and see how it feels. I think that would feel really neat to knit something with yarn that you've spun yourself. Like, man, life skills. If there's an, ever an apocalypse, I can still make clothes, I guess, because I can now spin very poorly but I can spin and I can knit so I don't want to talk too much about that because I don't want to turn the knitting podcast into a spinning podcast but I did want to mention that it's something to try give it a try if you like fiber if you like if you want to move beyond different fiber arts I mean there's crochet there's lots of different things to do but if you actually want to try spinning too that there's something very satisfying about like knowing I created this like I can use this to create something else you know like a hat or mittens or something but um it is something to try anyway so I would I would recommend that any knitter at least give it a try so you can see on have a little understanding of like the yarn the spinning process because I mean there's so much we have to know about yarn we talked about that earlier with some of the questions we answered about um you know just like the importance of the gauge and the yarn weight and the fiber content or even how it's spun because that can make a difference in your garment and choosing the right type of yarn for the right project even includes how that yarn is spun so i would say just even for that i'm not trying to convince everybody to go spin all of a sudden but just to understand how the process works and you can apply that knowledge to your knitting to choosing the right types of yarns for the projects that you want to knit we usually end talking about a book on our podcast, but I think we're going to skip it this month because we are closing in on quite a long video here. So I'd like to wrap things up right now and just say thank you for joining me. Thanks for sitting and knitting with me. And while I did all the talking, I guess, but if you want to just continue sitting and knitting with me, then I'll put a link right here for the playlist for this year's, all of the podcast episodes from this year. I'll have to start a new playlist for the next podcast, but thank you for joining me. And you can click right there and I'll see you in the next video.